Thank you for joining Ed Place, live lessons from your homes. I'm Mr Phillips and you've joined us for a science lesson today. You may have heard of Ed Place and use us as part of your daily learning routine, but if you haven't, here's a quick summary about us. We're an online digital learning platform written for students for children between year one and up to year 11, offering English, maths, science, and 11 plus self-marked activities written by fully qualified teachers. We're bringing live English, maths, and science lessons into your homes during the school closure period. So why not join us over the next few weeks as we tackle some key topics? You might find it useful to have a pen and paper handy as we go so that you can make some note of any key ideas or jot things down. You'll also need to be able to access your EdPlace account. If you don't have an EdPlace account, do not worry. You can access all of our activities if you go to edplace.com. We'll go over this in much more detail when we get to that part. So, welcome to today's GCSE science lesson on enzymes with Mr Phillips. By the end of today's lesson, we're aiming to achieve either one or all of the following three steps. Explain how enzymes work by the lock and key theory. Apply the lock and key theory to explain how temperature affects the rate of enzyme controlled reactions. And analyse and explain the temperature rate of reaction graph. So, let's start with a brief explanation as to what enzymes are. Enzymes are biological catalysts. They are made out of protein. So all enzymes you ever talk about are going to be protein molecules. Their job is to increase the rate of chemical reactions in the cell. And therefore, they control all the reactions inside living organisms. They increase the rate of chemical reactions in the cell by lowering the activation energy. Activation energy is a term you will learn in chemistry and it means the minimum amount of energy required to start a chemical reaction. Reactions in our cells are just biological versions of chemical reactions. You've probably met enzymes before, and you'll have studied them when you studied the digestive system. As you see in the picture, enzymes, such as the enzyme amylase, breaks down large, insoluble molecules into small soluble molecules. In the picture, the large insoluble molecule called starch is being broken down with the enzyme amylase into smaller molecules called maltose. Enzymes are for, used throughout the digestive system. These digestive enzymes always carry out the job of digestion, which is breaking down large insoluble molecules into small soluble molecules. This allows these then digested molecules to be able to enter the bloodstream. It is worth noting, however, enzymes can also do a wider range of reactions, including building smaller molecules into larger molecules and turning one type of molecule into another type. When you studied enzymes in part of the digestive system, you should have studied three main types of enzymes. But in case you haven't, let's look at them now. Remember, Enzymes break down large insoluble molecules into small soluble molecules as the process of digestion, allowing the molecules to enter the bloodstream. So the first molecule we're going to be looking at, the first enzyme, is amylase, which is a type of carbohydrate enzyme. And this is found in the mouth. It digests starch into glucose. And again, starch is a large insoluble molecule and that breaks into glucose, which is a small soluble molecule. The enzyme works best at a pH level of seven, which we call its optimum pH. When we go down to the stomach, the group of enzymes is called protease enzymes. They digest proteins into amino acids. And again, the protein is a large insoluble molecule and the amino acids are small soluble molecules. The stomach has a pH of about two, due to the fact that it has hydrochloric acid in it. This again is the optimum pH for protease enzymes. In the small intestine, we break down lipids. 
Lipids are the more scientific name for, the, for fats. The enzyme that breaks down lipids are called lipase. Lipase digests lipids into two molecules called fatty acids and glycerol. Lipids are large, insoluble molecules, and they're broken down into two small, soluble molecules of fatty acids and glycerol to allow them to digest and go into the bloodstream. The pH that is optimum for lipase is about pH 8. So, how do enzymes actually work? Well, if you look at this diagram, you'll see that there are two molecules joined, a pink molecule bonded to an orange molecule, and they make up the substrate. The substrate is always the molecule that the enzyme is going to complete a reaction with. The substrate fits perfectly into this part of the enzyme called the active site. They form an enzyme substrate complex. In this picture, which could represent digestion, you're taking two molecules that are bonded together and breaking them apart into separate individual molecules. And the enzyme will put pressure and strain on that bond until it breaks. The products then become released and the enzyme is able to be reused. This is a very specific process and it is called the lock and key theory. The substrate will only fit into the right shape active site. So if you look at the diagram on the left with the blue enzymes, the substrates in those, that picture would not fit with the enzymes on the second picture. And that is because the substrate and the active site have a complementary shape to each other. They have a specific shape. So the substrate has to fit perfectly into the active site for the enzyme to complete the reaction. This makes enzymes specific to one substrate. So for example, a protease enzyme will not be able to break down a lipid. It can only break down a protein because that will be the substrate that fits into its active site. This, as I said a moment ago, is called the lock and key theory. This works in a similar way to a lock and a key. A lock is designed to only fit and to only work with a key that fits it perfectly. So the key is a bit like the substrate and the lock is a bit like the enzyme and the active site of the enzyme. The right key will unlock the lock. An incorrect key will not fit in properly and it won't unlock it. The incorrect shaped substrate will not fit correctly into the active site and therefore a reaction will not happen. The lock and key theory is important to remember for exams. And again, just to remind you, it means that the substrate has a complementary shape to the active site for a reaction to happen, and that makes the enzymes specific. Temperature greatly affects the rate of enzyme activity. This graph is a common graph given to you in exam questions that might include up to six mark questions asking you to use the graph to describe how temperature affects the rate of enzyme activity. This graph is split into two parts and you must remember to talk about both parts during your answer. If you look at the green line, which represents the optimum temperature, you must describe what happens below the optimum temperature and above the optimum temperature. So starting below the optimum temperature, you can see that as you increase the temperature, you increase the rate of enzyme activity. This is because both the substrates and the enzymes gain more kinetic energy as you increase the temperature. This extra energy means both the substrates and the enzymes are able to move around more and they will collide more often. As a result, they will form more enzyme substrate complexes and you'll get more reactions. At the optimum temperature, that is the point where the enzyme substrate complexes are made at the optimum speed. And then after the optimum temperature, the rate of enzyme activity decreases. This is because as you increase the temperature, the bonds that hold the enzyme together start to break. This causes the shape of the active site to change and the enzyme becomes denatured. 
With a change in shape of the active site, the lock and key theory no longer works because the substrate is no longer a complementary shape to the enzyme's active site. Therefore, they'll be able to make no more enzyme substrate complexes and the enzyme rate of reaction drops to zero. When enzymes are denatured, this is permanent and it cannot be undone. You should always use the word denatured and never say an enzyme is killed or it is destroyed. So let's put this new learning into practice. Sign into your EdPlace account now or go to www.edplace.com. So how do we find the activity? Well, if you don't have an EdPlace account, visit www.edplace.com, select Learn, go onto the Science tab, select GCSE Biology, then click on Science, Combined Science, OCR, 21st Century, the human body staying alive, and then click on Activity, Understand Enzyme Function. If you do have an EdPlace account, log in, go to Science, to Biology, to Biology Combined, to OCR 21st Century, the human biology staying alive, and then click on the Understand Enzyme Function. And again, regardless what exam board you do, this activity will be suitable for all students. To ensure we're looking at the same task, this is what the worksheet you're doing should have looked like. Let's have a look now at some questions together at some of the questions you might have found more difficult. Question one. When we look at question one, the question said, what is the job of an enzyme? So your choices were to stop reactions in the body, to make reactions happen quicker in the human body, or to cause digestion. So whilst we have talked about digestion as our example for this lesson, it isn't the only job of enzymes. So the job of enzymes is to make reactions happen more quickly in the human body and any other living thing by lowering the activation energy. Question four, what happens to an enzyme when the active area changes shape? Well, this one has got to use a slightly different word to describe the active site. However, it still should be pretty obvious what the answer is. So the answer is, it becomes denatured. So as I described in the lesson, it, you can never say an enzyme dies because they are not living. Their, their function is always specific, so it never changes. And it would obviously not be able to continue its role if the active site changed shape because the lock and key theory would no longer work. Question five. If you took an enzyme from the human body and put it into a cup, what temperature would you need that cup to be so the enzyme could perform its role effectively? So this question might seem quite strange on the outset. And it's an application question where it's taking something you know and putting it into a new situation. Hopefully you're aware that the human body temperature is 37 degrees. And this would be the answer for this question because enzymes have an optimum temperature, the temperature they work fastest at. And it makes sense that enzymes in the human body, therefore, the optimum temperature then will be 37 degrees, the human body temperature. Most exams will say the optimum temperature is about 40 degrees. But again, if you're ever given it on a graph, you must read it directly off the graph. Question eight. The environment in the stomach is very acidic, pH one. Study the diagram below and then choose a statement that describes the stomach's enzymes. So you can see in the graph below that it shows you when an enzyme reaches its optimum pH. That is when the enzyme's activity becomes the greatest. So you need to remember that wherever the enzyme's at its optimum pH, its activity will be the fastest at that point. So choose one correct answer. Either the optimum pH for the enzyme in the stomach is pH 7, the optimum pH for the enzyme in the stomach is pH 12, or the optimum pH for the enzymes in the stomach is pH 1. Well, if you read the question, the information, as in many GCSE exam questions, is actually given to you in the question. So the answer should be the bottom one. The optimum pH for enzymes in the stomach is pH 1. 
You may have noticed that this number is a different pH to what I mentioned in the lesson. The pH of the stomach is highly acidic, so they'll accept either pH 1 or pH 2 during any exam question. Question 9. The diagram shows how enzyme activity changes according to the temperature. The optimum temperature for the enzymes is 37 degrees because this is the normal body temperature. What happens when the temperature increases above 37 degrees C? Either the enzyme activity falls rapidly as the heat denatures the enzyme, the enzyme activity decreases gradually, or the enzyme activity continues as normal. Well, even if you didn't know the answer to this one, you should be able to see it from the graph because it's going to a rapid decline down to zero activity. So therefore the answer should be the top one, enzyme activity falls rapidly as heat denatures the enzyme. So let's recap what we set out to do today and see how you got on. Hopefully now you are able to explain how enzymes function by the lock and key theory. Hopefully you're able to apply the lock and key theory to explain how the temperature affects the rate of enzyme controlled reactions. And hopefully you're able to analyse and explain the temperature rate of reaction graph. We know that some of you will feel you need a little more practice to really master these skills, whilst others of you are ready for your next challenge. To help you know which activity you to select next, here are some suggestions. The activity we just tried is listed as activity two. If it felt a little tricky for you, why not try activity one to gain confidence in the skills that you need? Then give it another go to see if you are more ready to tackle it this time. Good luck. As we finish up today, here are other places you can find or access support. We look forward to working with you again soon and keep practicing in the meantime.